Hello, everyone. Thanks for joining us. Hi. Our very first end of year wrap up for the podcast, the catch up, and I think we're going to be co branded it with Trend Desk as well. Um, so today we're going to be looking at the four big trends that define 2020, and we are joined in no particular order by our brand new head of client services, Mr. James Lees. Hi, everybody. Our head of operations, Charlie Gibson. Hello there. Our supreme CEO, Mr. Rich Himsworth. Hi. I'm going to have a game show. So what am I supposed to do to that intro? I think it was a, well, it was a good intro. And our very resident <laughs> staff man, uh, Callum. Uh, yeah, the best till last, thank you very much. Cool. Yeah, so we're going to run through it. Callum's going to present a few things that we've seen and probably discussed previously on the podcast as well. Um, um, yeah, so go take it away, Cal. Do it. Um, so... Quarter one was, well, I've named the quarter that set the trends for 2020. Um, and towards the end of the first quarter, we saw the national lockdown. And these trends really did accelerate into Q2. But um, what we saw within our data was a very different quarter in terms of which categories were growing and, and what people were purchasing. Um, so it wasn't growth across the board. Uh, if you look to the, the far right of the chart, you'll see that fashion declined. Um, and probably all of this is, is due in, in some way to uh, what was happening with the virus. So fashion didn't see any growth, whereas things like home appliances, gaming, uh, animals, uh, kind of sports performance, gardening, home and living, uh, were all massive growth categories. Um, we, when we add in average order value into that as well, it, it, it spells a very interesting picture in terms of um, where were people spending their money. Um, with the news of, of lockdowns and working from home, we saw people really start to view their homes more than just a place in which they live, but more as in an office, a gym, a pantry, um, and where they would spend their whole lives. So things like home and living and home appliances grew massively, and um, we saw people spend a lot on that when they were trying to adjust to this new lifestyle. Some interesting categories also came to the fore. Things like uh, gardening and accessories, um, gaming, animals and pets. We we discussed on a previous podcast that um, people either became gardeners or chefs, um, which is, is definitely what we saw in the data in terms of where people were spending their money and, and which categories they were spending them in. So it was a story of growth. And it was a story of different categories seeing kind of growth that they probably would never expect to see. Probably never so seen early on. as well. Yeah. That's I think the key thing. So in terms of anecdotally speaking, I'll throw this one over to James because I know you were doing quite a bit of gardening. How did your how did things start to turn around for you? What sort of things were you focusing on purchase wise when, when gardening for me? How did your garden turn around? Um, what was I buying for my garden? Uh, stones, you know, like little pebbles to make it look nice. Because I'm not much of a, I, I'm not much of a planter, but I did buy some nice plants. Do you get any plum slate? I got plum slate. Well, we spoke about plum slate on one of the very first podcast trips, if you remember. Right? Come full circle. Yeah, we have. I'll, I'll get me school leavers book out soon if you want. <laughs> well, you should say that. No. Uh, plum slate, uh, storage boxes, plants. Plant, planters and things like that. Um, I did buy um, a nice cordless um, works pressure washer, so you never have to plug it in. You don't even have to connect it to a hose pipe. <laughs> How does that even work? Oh, <laughs> it's, 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 so, it's get like a, moisture out the air. Oh, like, not quite. So what you will do, you'll go to like um, you go your, your, your tap, kitchen tap, other taps are available. Uh, you'll put your wee bucket, which is a collapsible bucket as well, by the way, so for storage is fantastic. Um, you get your collapsible bucket, fill that with water, then you've got like a little pipe which runs from the pressure washer to the bucket, 
press the button, sprays away, and that's run by a battery charger, 20 volt battery charger thing. Would you have bought that previously? When, when not a chance, mate. It would no. not have been on my radar. All right, okay. So when you started, I mean, were you a gardener previously, or was this nah. something that? No, I've got a guy who comes to my house every two weeks, uh, paying 20 quid, and he, he mows me front and back lawn. Did you stop paying him during that period? No, of course I didn't, mate. I'm not going to cut my own grass, am I? I've done well for myself. So what, <laughs> so what were you, he was cutting your grass and you were putting the slate down around him, essentially? I put the slate right around him, mate. I was uh, planting around him. He used to come round every couple of weeks. Oh, there, just a nice new plant you put down, James. Oh, thank you very much, Derek. Is it something you're going to carry on doing, though? Absolutely not, mate, no. Yeah, at all. So it's not no, the pressure is going to be I think that's what's interesting. There is that shift in trend then back, back away from this whole lockdown activity, isn't it? That's the thing. Like, what is going to be kept up? Is this some growth that is pretty unprecedented and then nobody's going to see again? I think so. Like, people like they're going to try painting themselves instead of getting a painting decorator in. Like I say, you've got people like myself who never even considered gardening before, gave it a go. I became quite the expert in flat pack. I enjoyed framing pictures, all sorts of stuff. But I have no intentions of once we get some relative normality to where we do any of that activity again. I think yeah, it's worked I think almost like it, it's almost worked a bit like like an introduction to a whole lot of new things. So yeah. it's almost like joining the gym in January. So mm. 100 people will join the gym in January. By March, about 10 are left. So it'll be similar with this. So 100 people getting to get uh, gardening or online gaming or whatever it might be or cooking, that type of thing. Yeah. And then you'll have people that just drift away from it. But all those sectors will have grown because you will have people where they've just, they, they carry on. There's, there's a number that will carry on and make yeah. yeah. I think everyone's done the full loop. I think we've experienced, you know, I've tried to be a chef, a gardener, yoga, expertise, everything like that. And, you know, a decorator as well. But I think we now know we've either got a new hobby, we know what it leaves to be experts as well. So there's loads of people I know who, you know, invested in a bread maker, everything like this for the banana bread and everything like that. And all of the, you know, all the utensils. And now we're just like, yep, yeah, don't think I'll use that again gathering dust in the cupboard but you never know with all the uncertainty so at least it's there for a rainy day yeah so for me like I, I reckon just again seeing how sort of my habits have changed seeing how sort of my friends family's habits have changed I think for me I, I can definitely see the game in sort of vertical carrying on with what it's been doing especially with the sort of non-hobbyist gamers previously I think we were talking about last night, Rich, where there's sort of these a lot more of the free to play games where it's picking up sort of in in app spending that type yes. of thing. Yes. Mm -hmm. so are there any other of these verticals that we that, that people think are good are going to do well off this and carry on the growth, or do you reckon it's, it's been a flash in the pan for the majority? I think there'll be a few that are a flash. Well, like I say, I think all of them will maintain a level of, you know, like the onboarded customers kind of thing and they'll maintain to a level but i think your biggest ones to suffer are going to be your kind of almost these kind of um, local takeout kind of yeah you know, people doing doing yeah. cakes doing that i think they'll be the first ones to fall away because i think it's just too easy to do a big you know to do a big shop and things like that and people are taking less it's almost like you had that time on your hands under lockdown you had that time to have like put more care and attention into something as life yeah. speeds up again, people have less time to kind of, you know, kind of appreciate these these little things. So I think they go by the wayside. I think an uh, interesting point, um, something we've talked about a lot within Trendess and, and within Salesfire is re-commerce um, and people buying uh, used goods. And there's a trend of that growing. And if we say that these categories have grown, but maybe... A flash in the pan maybe like you james you've you've tried gardening it's not for you but you've got the equipment maybe re-commerce is going to be massive uh in 21 because of that because i think eBay people... might have a pickup yeah. Of it. yeah you'd expect a lot of things to be appearing on gumtree yeah. yeah used once between march and april <laughs> yeah <laughs> if it was home gyms so, I mean, this feeds in, we discussed a lot on the podcast in the early days. I mean, it's nearly a year ago now when we went through it. Um, the subscription services. It's funny what you touched on there, James, with your gardener. So you literally, you, you were still doing extra on top, but you never cancelled that. 
yeah. So you, you're a subscription man as well. Is there anything that you're going to be canceling? Are there things that are going to be you're not going to be carrying on with, or is it something that no, you're going to no? Um, so the, I have a few subscription things that still come through. I didn't cancel any of them. So the main two I've got, one's actually been delivered to the house this morning. It's one called the Gusta Box. Right. Um, which basically is a, there's a theme every month of different snacks and treats. Mm-hmm. Like you pay 13 quid a month and there's just those different stuff. And it's a nice surprise. Like the, the young one enjoys it and I, I do and like Kelly does it's like it's sound. And you've got to feel like daft little spice ones for cooking and stuff like that because I, I cooked before lockdown anyway. So for me, like, you know, um, I didn't get any alcohol subscription ones because Aldi was still open. Yeah, true. Yeah. It's like just, it was right, like, it's, like less than a mile away from your house, so um, yeah, because that's still like that was like you no know, in early lockdown. Like, okay, I didn't go to a shop probably for the first four weeks, but at that you kind of got the confidence of doing it. You didn't mind just having to drive down to your local Aldi because it's the one opportunity when you get to get out of your house. Yeah, it's the thing you go yeah. to, or you stick with it essentially. Yeah, I think Callum, you mentioned about um, sports and outdoor. Um, there's a lot of kind of I think in terms of subscriptions as well, a lot of them. People have experienced classes or kind of, you know, exercise classes essentially that, you know, maybe a bit, you know, down south or maybe not in the northeast that they've, you know, been attending like, you know, all over the world. Like there's some classes I was experiencing on like a Saturday where people from London, they were outside the UK, they've joined a membership now and they wouldn't have experienced or even in their region being able to do that class. Oh, so I think that's like yeah, I think that's been a great thing. And I think it's something where, you know, when lockdown is and people were able to go back in the gyms or studios, they've had the option now, you know, what they prefer. Maybe they haven't, you know, been able to attend a certain time, maybe five o'clock just after work. But if they've been working from home, they're able to do that now. So it's definitely more flexible with the subscription. Yeah. It's almost the same as um, but what we're seeing with remote working. People are able to sort of source expertise from places where they never could really sort of be viable especially i mean we're sort of seeing that with some of the things we're looking at now we're getting we're, we're, we're able to connect and work with people that are in sort of more bustling places of industry if that makes sense um i know you are not the biggest fan of the subscription service rich is this gonna are, are, did you ever get any closer to getting on the board with it all or not no since we last talked <laughs> That was a constant debate on this podcast. <laughs> it's just that it won't last. So, folks, I found myself cancelling a few. So there was a point where it's like, ah, it's only six quid, it's only seven quid. And then I'm, I got my, um, I was looking at my funds at the end of the year. And it's like the holes I've put in the bucket in my bank account with all of these little subscriptions. Yeah. It's crazy. It, it's mental, really. I had to cancel everything. What do you think, slightly on the side point here, what do you think is going to happen to the likes of, um, like Zoom and things, where obviously they've onboarded like crazy over lockdown. The share prices went through the roof. The values yeah. of these companies went crazy. I'm wondering what will happen with them because they must have a huge fall away from what they what they did have. There so must be so many users that, that are leaving that. Like the people like no buying garden equipment rose to a level. Will that be the same next year? No, but we'll some of those people will continue it. So. Some companies have adapted, went to more home, like home work, and then they ever have done previously. So I think Zoom will They'll be higher than what they were, weren't they? It's like this thing we're describing here, where the, they'll have onboarded new customers, then so many will leave. So yeah. the likes of Zoom, I'm guessing, yes, it'll be, they'll have grown more than what they would have, but there must be there must be a point where there's a huge kind of peak in, in users and subscriptions that's fallen away a bit. Yeah, we'll do. Based on 2019, it'll be much higher, but yeah, based on 2020, probably much less. Yeah. Based on the emails I've been getting from, they've been offering pretty deep discounts to sign people up on the early contracts as well. Have okay. um, Well, not contracts, but the early subscription, yeah, from the emails I've been receiving. Which is a smart yeah. thing there, but I mean, you, you, you've you got people who aren't necessarily going to need the service as much in six months' time, sign them up for 12 months and see what you can do at that point. But this leads yeah. quite neatly on to quarter two as well, I feel. Um, everything, that, like all the smaller companies and everyone trying to get online. And, uh, Q2 there. Yeah, so um, moving into Q2 and the quarter where commerce went online, really. Um, if we look at a chart from the Office of National Statistics, which show the percentage of all retail sales um, that were through e-commerce, um, we can go back to 
like 2006 there. And um, what we've got on this chart is, is looking from 2015 to 2020, so the last five years. And um, we've seen a steady growth, but in Q2 2020, um, the, the growth went to about a third. Uh, so one in three of all um, sales were made online. Um, which is a massive jump um, and a 70% rise from where that was in Q2 2019. Mm -hmm. um, so obviously driven by uh, major lockdowns, um, people having to shop online and uh, bricks and mortar closing. But that level of growth was so huge. Um, and it, it does beg the question, will it stay at that level? Obviously, it'll come down uh, as bricks and mortar reopen. But has this been the kind of turning point for e-commerce? It was always rising and it was always chipping at bricks and mortar. Um, but now it it's had a opportunity like no other, really, to get everyone online. And what we saw was um brands that were mature uh to e-commerce and were ready for that uh really benefited brands that weren't um fell apart so you know those underdogs at amazon um had a incredible uh series of events because they had that infrastructure ready and um, to deal with all all that traffic and what we saw as well in terms of, of search demand is um, things growing that we would never see in a normal year. So in Q2, things like delivery driver jobs and Royal Mail jobs were massively searched for. Um, again, showing this trend of, well, everyone's shopping online, people are getting more and more deliveries and also coupled with the fact of uh, the country going into a, a furlough scheme and, and lots of people losing their usual jobs. So yeah. um, that was really interesting to see from Google in terms of what people were searching for um, and how that all linked in with with uh, what was happening in a kind of societal and political landscape. I think um, the death of the high street, I know it's a bit cliche term at this point but fed things up a lot but I, I honestly found myself going back to the shops I don't um, I don't know if anyone else has but as soon as I got the chance to go back out I, do, I have fallen away with my online grocery shopping for instance don't do that anymore at all the things I'm getting on Amazon I've stopped doing I'm, I'm trying to get out of the shop as much as I can as soon as we finish this lockdown um, do we think that it's caused the impact that Everybody's saying it has, or do you reckon it's, there's still time for the high street yet? I'll go to Charlie that one. Yeah, I think in terms of the high street, I think a lot of online shopping, a lot of us do it anyway in terms of browsing mm -hmm. and searching for particular items. But I think for me, you know, earlier on in, um, in October, I think it was when we went through the webinar for Empathy, was more kind of what people are used to shopping in stores, so the flexibility of returns. Um, you know, that's increased the different returns methods. I think people now have started using those, you know, return loggers. It's just ease, you know, ease of access. But I think the one thing um, with something I was reading is more people have missed, you know, that the buying experience of trying stuff on and, you know, kind of that increase in average order value that you mentioned there. People are buying probably more in terms of that actually can't see and feel the product um, while they're in the store. So I think that's been kind of a key thing for people especially for the gift buying season that we're in now as well. I think, you know, people want to actually see the product before, you know, if it's a big ticket item, anything like that. So I think for me, you know, people probably really wanted to go in. I think it's probably certain industries, um, you know, kind of from the tech side and, you know, TVs, you know, for Curry's, you know, we were there last week and buying a new phone and the, the queues were huge, but it was more gift buying rather than treating themselves. Mm -hmm. for, um, so from uh, an infrastructure perspective, James, um, I know oh, yeah. you discussed this previously on a podcast. Um, how do you think this is going to change how people are set up? Do you think we're going to now see sort of warehouses losing a lot of what they were getting put through from the smaller retailers, the ones that were shipping online? Or do you reckon we're seeing sort of 
the DHL driver several times coming up a road all day long. That was never the same before. I think it's going to be a mixed bag, right? Charlie said, like, there's still going to be that need for this kind of high street experience. Now, I know, like, uh, in fashion in particular, they're, they're seeing a huge increase in return rates as well, haven't they? Because average order, you yeah. Yeah. You know, you, you're going to, let's say you're going to buy a top in three different colours, maybe, because you don't know which one's going to suit you best. Mm. Um, but, again, maybe people don't like, the experience don't like the returning process and things like that. So you start seeing them people go back to the high street. But yeah, I think it's, been, it, it's hard to predict. Uh, yeah. If I'm being brutally honest, like myself, I've, I've generally been an online shop when it comes to stuff like clothes and things like that, just because I've worked in the industry. So I like how it works. It suits me better. I don't like walking through the high street and trying clothes on and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. But again, everyone's different. I think there will be once, you know, use the term back to normal, um, you will see the percentage of people online now will be higher, but there's going to be still, um, like Rich said, it's like you'll see that massive jump of people doing it. And be that life set, and all. some will return back to the older ways, but still, the percentage of people doing online will be high. So the high street will be affected long term because of it. But I think they need to adapt. I mean, there's loads of talks in regards to like, no, making high street stores smaller and being it kind of like more like a try it on personal shopper experience, yeah. and then getting the product posted out to you like that kind of thing. I think that's pretty where the high street needs to adapt. Instead, of like you go to Middlesbrough. You got that giant House of Fraser building, giant Debenhams building, giant Site building. Do they need to be that big? Absolutely not. No, like trying to you kind of reach products. Go and have that try on experience. Talk to somebody. Get that kind of like a, a retail experience, a personal shopper experience per se, and then get your products eat, like posted into store or posted direct to your house. Mm -hmm. That would be a good way for the high street kind of adapt in that instance, rather than just having rails and rails of clothes. You think with someone like Debenhams who have been kind of in trouble through this and some of the other department stores you'd think that that would be the ideal setup going forwards where it's all yeah, kind yeah. of um concessions isn't it sat within yeah, yeah. sat yeah. within the big building you'd think that'd be the ideal but obviously they're the ones that kind of really they were first in line to get in get in trouble not yeah. just now but leading up to all of this this year i've well, been for a while haven't i let's be honest like we talked with evan and was going out of uh, business for a long long time now yeah. house of players obviously had the troubles pre-covid and Mr. Ashley came in and bought them. Um, it's yeah, it's, it's so that kind of like huge department store thing has changed. Maybe are we, are we going to see a switch in regards to you know the high street being a brand concession stand place? Yes, yeah. so, no, the high street will be a barber, Fred Perry kind of situation rather than a department store that sells all these brands. Mm -hmm. I don't know. Yeah, without uh, without naming specific brands i guess there's there's certainly been when we've spoken to brands in the past they've certainly had a hunger to cut out the middleman cut out the independent yeah yeah and just go direct to retailers yes yeah. so there could be that i just don't know what you do with the like these giant buildings so you can adapt you can adapt online you can adapt like trends come and go but when you've got a 200 year old building in the middle of town the likes of you know some of your debenham buildings and the like i just don't know what you really do with them well, I know the mid middles in particular, they're on about changing to more of like a leisure complex town centre rather than a retail one. You can make it a giant ball pit. Yeah, 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 just your giant, giant ball pool and a big, massive bowling alley. Well, like, no, you look at like what you, you lead to Manchester done with your big kind of like, you know, like Leeds Trinity Kitchen when they've got those independent like food outlets. In yeah. It's like trying to, like, it's trying to keep it in the town centre for longer than eventually the, the remaining brands on the high street will do better off the back of that because you're going to town for a bit of food a couple of drinks all right i've had a couple of pints you know what i've had a couple of, I'm, I'm a little bit tipsy now what about the top yeah that kind of situation you're in town anyway mm -hmm. so there's other reasons to pull people in the town centre rather than oh we've got a massive top shop yeah so i think yeah it'd be the food and drink that draws people in won't it yeah absolutely we've seen a lot of more niche sort of smaller independents come through with it with a thirst for sort of personalization and the sort of the recommendations and that type of thing and being able to cater for their niches. Do you see any of the bigger dogs like your Debenhams, like the bigger companies that sort of really struggle in or have struggled? Do, are, we, are you seeing them get in front of this and sort of get in the vanguard or do you think this is going to be something that sticks with the niche? For me, I think the, for me, one that stands out, I don't, I don't think we spoke about it so far is like the beauty industry. Mm. So for me, in terms of your, House of Fraser's and your Debenhams, there's a lot of the beauty concessions there. And the experience, I guess, for, you know, if you pick the foundation or anything like that, is speaking to an expert, actually, you know, 
you know, you know, going through what's the right colour, what's the right match, trying it on. Um, there's a lot of brands that I've seen have actually, you know, got a lot more social influencers using them in a different way. So mm. like into stories and going through kind of what their routine is day in, day out. So you've had stories about wellness, looking after their skin for a particular problem, yeah. highlighting kind of the product descriptions on there and kind of changing their website based on that. So I think it's been quite nice to, to that one, especially people wearing less makeup, you know, mm. if they're trying to give their skin time, you know, for, for months or I think for me, that's going to be very interesting once the shop's open, how people are actually going to use those beauty concessions moving forward. Yeah, I think this plays into what the, the, the trend we, we, we're going to be putting forward in Q3 as well, which is um, how people were trying to sort of repair local commerce and local damage. Uh, Cal, we've got some stats here. Do you want to go through them, Cal, quick? Yeah, yeah, sure. Let's move Particularly on to the Q3. top five rising searches there, they're pretty interesting. Yeah, the, the quarter where people did try and repair that local damage, and you see that in the data. Um, so it, when we moved into Q3, and um, it seemed like the government thought COVID went away for a few months, so they chucked everyone back into like local hospitality for eat out to help out and basically pushed everyone to, to help their local community, which was a great trend to see after that rise in e-commerce. And we saw... Um, this is from the ACS. Um, in that quarter, some of the top convenience store searches were like local shop near me, uh, local farm shop. Uh, does the local shop do delivery? And um, hopefully we see that kind of trend. I personally would like to see it um, and continue into 2021. We saw actual businesses, local businesses saw that um, they had a positive impact in terms of sales and an average order value, average basket spends in Q3. Um, and I would say that was a kind of antidote to having to be stuck indoors. You you said it there, Josh. Um, as soon as you were allowed out, people saw the damage it was creating to, to the local community, to these small businesses, and, and hopefully kind of thought, well, well, Amazon have done well enough. Let's kind of try and support the local bookshop or uh, the local convenience store, the local kind of uh, bakery. So I think that was definitely a, a trend we saw in, in Q3 and, and one that we'd like, to, well, I'd like to think that once we start coming out of these lockdowns, uh, it's something that, that is here to stay. We've seen sort of big pushes from the, the reviews companies, haven't we? Like reviews that I owe and sort of even Google as well has been pushing their um, reviews for local businesses. Um, is sort of, as we see more of these niche, these niche sellers go online, do you think reviews are going to be more important next year? Do you think we're going to be seeing a lot more of um, these review, review platforms getting out there and sort of disrupting things a little bit? I'll throw that one to Jim. I know you've worked with reviews in the past quite a bit. Um, what do you mean in regards to like the different way reviews will be collected in that respect? Yeah, like, sort of the, the innovations that people seem to be making at the minute, like especially with, with some of reviews that I owe when they take video reviews now, that type of yeah. thing would be a lot more important to people going forward. I think so. I think people will maybe consider a few other elements in regards to how to purchase now because I don't think Amazon got great press through lockdown and rightly so um so a lot of people like like looking at searches there people looking for more localized things been a lot of stuff from uh in teesside in particular where people are trying to promote more independent retailers whether they be e-commerce or bricks and mortar so i think you know the the reviews element of things will become more important because you know people will be considering the purchase more and yeah. do the smaller independence eat work harder on that i think they do yeah so in regards to sort of the social proofing, are we seeing, because before social proofing, what it was a Facebook page, it was yeah. a few comments on Instagram. Do you think we're going to be seeing that rolled into sort of business plans moving forward and sort of how products are developed? I think, I think it has to be, yeah? Yeah. I think definitely, I think, I think in terms of that review, like you were saying there, um, Josh, in terms of the... Um, it's like the communities and I think neighbourhoods as well, you know, when people were struggling for delivery slots, you know, we're experiment, experiment with different supermarkets that we've used before, mm -hmm. but also from the local shops, it's kind of your word of mouth or Facebook groups that people were using for recommendations. Yeah. 
um, and the experiences and, you know, why they've used them. I think a lot of people were relying on that as well. I think reviews is definitely going to be a key part, um, yeah. especially if they've never heard of them before. Yeah. Um, and it's something, you know, it's kind of that fear of trying something new. You don't know what the quality is going to be like or the customer service. But I think a lot of people have just had to jump in with both feet and kind of we didn't have a choice, um, you know, back in Q2. I know it's something we made a big push on with our clients and what we were trying to communicate across the sort of, especially with our managed service side of things, but empathy was a huge thing in Q3 as well. I mean, the way people were managing the comms and the way they were sort of managing their, their, um, their marketing mix and things like that. How important was sort of empathy to, to sort of, well, should always be important, but how much of a difference did it make in Q3? Yes, yeah, so I think, you know, a lot of people, you know, in terms of customer service online, it was kind of more, you know, people have been, a, you know, unfortunately some were being aggressive with, kind of the stock you know kind of fearing people of how much stock they've got left and they should get it in case they do run out I think for me you know I went on about it in the webinar it's, it's time to flip that script it's review your current strategy of customer service and how you utilize it and support them you know what are they thinking and feeling at that time there's mm -hmm. been so much you know uncertainty I know that's another word that <laughs> a lot of people wanted the keywords for 2020 but you know, for us, we, we don't really know. We don't really know what they're thinking or feeling and what situation they're in. So you can see the content and the different ways they utilise and experience. You know, there's some brands that have, you know, switched their, their customer service from phones to, to chat online. Yeah. Uh, people are more shopping online to kind of the categories. We're not really sure, you know, they're normally visiting a high street store. Mm -hmm. um, and a lot of those are just needing this little bit of support and a little bit of recommendations of, of kind of the direction they should go in. And I think for empathy, you know, we've seen a lot of campaigns before previously, especially in the gift industry, yeah. in the card industry, where you can opt out in certain ones. So I think for me, it's, 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 a, it's always been a big thing, but I think it's been highlighted massively in retail this year. And I think it's, it should always be a core part of your, of your content strategy, especially moving into 2021. Yeah, I think everyone's been guilty a little bit of not listening to sort of what, what people are actually saying when it comes to that type of thing. Ties quite nicely into the reviews, but it also ties quite nicely into one of the big trends we saw in Q4, and that was was not really seeing the significance of Singles Day. Uh, I think have you got the stats there, Carl? Yeah, so Q4, um, the quarter that changed November forever. Um, basically, what we saw when Q4 happened, and, and more the second lockdown happened, so all that lovely uh, empathy stuff and helping out local communities kind of started to go back over itself as it did in Q2. Mm -hmm. um, and what we saw was a November that in 2020 was bigger every day than uh, Black Friday was in 2019. Um, and not only did we see a rise in, in commerce, we saw... Uh, an obvious rise on Black Friday, which you would always expect to see. But then it was kind of like a, a two-pronged peak, really, where we saw a massive growth on the 11th of November, which when we um, kind of studied where that came from, it was on Singles Day. Um, now, what we've started to learn here at Salesfire, and especially with Trendesk, is sometimes the initial start, the initial insight, the initial peak doesn't tell the whole story. And what we then found out when we looked into a specific category, we saw that, for example, clothing and accessories um, was huge on Singles Day and accounted for nearly half of, of every sale uh, that day in, in terms of our e-commerce tracking. Mm -hmm. So that's when we we kind of start looking around at other categories did we also see a peak no we didn't not on singles there things like health and beauty or um gaming or home and living weren't huge on singles there they they had their peaks as expected on black friday but what we what we learned here was if you're in that clothing space then this day is nearly as important to you as black friday and with it being new and not as mature, it's a real mm -hmm. strong opportunity. Yeah, so we're looking we're looking at a cultural shift, really, aren't we, in how people are buying and where they're buying in regards to 
fashion. Yeah. So I'll throw this to you, Rich. One, are you going to be waiting for Singles Day next year to redo your, your wardrobe? And two, is this something that people need to start looking into in regards to strategy? Or do you think it's a tad too early to pull the trigger on it? Well, I think so, because if people are, what, what tends to happen in all these dates, well, there's no tens about it, it does happen. Um, conversion rates go up. So your conversion rates go up in multiples usually on Black Friday. Mm-hmm. So basically the traffic you're, you're paying for, it's more likely to convert. So these key dates when people are, they tend to be browsing on the build up. So what you'll see in the weeks, weeks running up to these things, they'll, they'll actually browse. They'll then execute and kind of purchase on that on that specific date Mm -hmm. so yes it makes absolute sense kind of doing something and you don't the thing is you don't have to go crazy with offers you you haven't got to go 30 percent off everything everything on your site you've just got to be kind of partaking in it so i I mean i get i get offers through from it's like boohoo man uh, newsletter and it's saying up to 70 percent off now they do it to the extreme, which is you see through after after a couple of visits to the site, you kind of see through it fairly quickly. You'll go on there and there'll be a few things that are seventy percent off, and then everything kind of tears down in terms of discount. It's just usually the stuff they can't get rid of that's that's the higher discount. Um, not doing it to that extreme, but at the same time, you haven't got to you haven't got to go in with huge huge discounts as long as you're partaking and communicating to your customer base that you're partaking in that day kind of thing. Yeah. Um, but you've seen it. You've seen it before. We know that it's like we're starting to see a, a kind of a new trend as well with a few sites whereby they actually shut up shop in the couple of days before before uh, Black yeah. Friday, mm-hmm. um, and they just collect they just collect newsletters and they don't they don't really dispatch anything. They're just waiting for that that day or that kind of that that sale to come live, and, because they know full well everyone's browsing no one's purchasing so it's quite important in the build-up to these days that's probably where singles day people haven't really done it black friday has been around for quite a few years so you've got this this kind of mentality of people browsing in the build-up and then starting to execute and purchase um whereas singles day haven't it's it's just happened as this kind of one spike which is kind of what black friday was seven or eight seven or eight years ago really i think it's a, it's a tough one as well because you I think people also fall into the trap of looking at the marketing calendar and going, right, there's this day, there's this day. Because if you look at, if you were Google it, there's an anniversary or a celebration day for everything. It's like, yeah, well, yeah. Day or one day is like, well, few day or the next. You know what I mean? It's, it's sort of finding those next ones and, and which ones are going to be the, uh, which ones are going to be the. Uh, you just got to pick out things that aren't ridiculous, really. Yeah. It's a, I think it's all this the... is, this is, that's where I get cynical towards some of these marketing companies where they'll they'll be celebrating National Hugs Week or something like that, and saying you as a you sell doors, so therefore you need to celebrate National Hugs Week or something ridiculous like that. You know, as long as you've just got to make them. That's an extreme example, obviously, but I have seen Valentine's Day offers and doorknobs. Um, wow. So yeah. <laughs> a few different ways, couldn't it? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, just as long as it they've got to tie in, you know. It's it's like that thing if everything's on sale and everything's you're highlighting every every day, then no yeah. day is special really. Well, it's one of those things though as well, isn't it? Would we have potentially said that about singles day at one point when we were looking at those map um, looking at those calendars? Yeah, probably. It's that's a, that's like a that. bit different. That's like a cultural shift, isn't it? Where I think a lot of you've got a kind of a, um like a growing Chinese population in um, in universities and colleges and things, a lot more people who will have settled over here, kind of thing, and and kind of bring bring with it these types of you know these types of trends. You got um, pent up demand for fashion and clothing throughout the year as well. So that's it. Yeah, you, you're right are... there. Yeah, like obviously fashion was one of the ones that suffered. I think yeah. active wear went through the roof, but actual yeah. fashion wear. Yeah, people were, you know, people stuck in. They weren't. You're right. Everyone's. It's it coincided with everyone coming out of this this state and then um, refreshing the wardrobe. I think. How, how do people going about get ahead of it? How how, how how obviously you don't want to be waiting to people maybe might have missed the boat with it this year, but there's obviously going to be somebody that have capitalised on it. Well, that would that is sounding like a cheap plug, but we'll carry on. Um, Start working with an agency or someone who's got eyes on everything. Yeah. Because what tends to happen, we've mentioned it before, 
companies have, e-commerce companies tend to have their eyes on what they're doing. Mm -hmm. They'll be looking at their rival, usually, um, usually picking up on things that the, the rival's doing blind. And it, it turns into a scenario of blind leading the blind. Yeah. Um, but agencies that work that are fairly well established should have figures on years and years gone by and figures and trends across multiple industries and multiple clients, like hundreds of clients potentially. Yeah. So that's the only opportunity where you're going to get that kind of, that kind of true voice, that true, true sense of what's, what's happening going forwards. Um, so yeah. kind of tying into those really, it's kind of why we've, we've launched that trends desk really, because yeah, it right. gives people the ability to kind of give some, get some insight into, into what the, uh, what the market's doing there and then it's all right kind of picking up on some of these i mean you've seen a lot of things off black, black friday a lot of stats are coming out now to do with black friday me as a retailer great that's uh that was that was weeks ago like exactly yeah. let me let me know in the build-up next time please you know it's it's this kind of um it's almost this requirement for a little bit more live live stats and a bit of insight before before the events really that i think are required yeah, I think it's, it's, yeah. it's important that they're actionable as well. I think that's what we try to do with Trend Desk is that the, the stats are quite chunky in a sense. You can take them away and you don't need uh, you don't need a data scientist to break them down and work out a strategy for it from you. You can look at a line graph and go, right, this is going up. Let's get something up and running. Um, I think we're still stuck in an environment where and we saw it in the run-up to, to Black Friday where people go, I'm just going to wait and see. Yeah, you know, exactly. like I'll just see what so and so does down the road, and I'll I'll see what yeah. offers they put on. I'll I'll just match whatever offers they're doing. Um, and really, you've seen you see the graph there. You see the build of sales in the in the weeks before. You see the amount of I mean, we've got the um, the visitors stats here, but the spikes in visitors were ridiculous in the page sessions. Like yeah, um, because people are doing the browsing, and the run up. So if you're not part of that, and you're just sitting there waiting for your blogs down the road to put their sale on and your copy is 20% sale. You've, you've missed the boat completely. Yeah, I think it's when you went back to kind of, you know, capturing the email data or capturing information is more um, for this Q4 activity, it's more the data capture for Q3, it's a kind of acquiring them and then that behavior and learning, you know, what's their yeah. preferences, what, what are the browsing on your site and more you know, rather this batch and blast email process or, you know, just one discount fits all is, you know, personalise it, tailor it based on what the shop's done previously and, if, you know, if you've captured if they're buying for a gift or a particular brand, mm -hmm. you know, people think, oh, there's too much work in the, in the detail. You don't have to go so far into personalisation. It's just more what experience they've had with you and, you know, what you think is going to help them, you know, convert. Yeah, awesome. All right, I think we're, um, we're at time now. I think we're going to leave it. Um, thanks everyone for joining us. Um, going to go around the table quickly. James, biggest trend next year, 2021. Biggest trend next year. Um, honestly, I think just based on we just been touched on there. I think it's the um, for these clothing retailers and brands to be thought leaders for Singles Day. I think just because of the, like the, the, it kind of came as a relative unknown and it was a shock to us suddenly seeing the numbers coming through. I think the retailer and brands that are really on song will become that thought leader for Singles Day moving forward. So I'm, I'm excited to see that trend next year. Cool. Yeah. I'm going to uh, put my prediction in. Um, I think the high streets have gone through the 12th round with Deontay Wilder. They've been knocked out, but they're going to get up like Tyson Fury and fight back and end up winning 2021. I think that localism trend is going to continue and people are going to want to build the community around them. I think no one's going to be in the UK. We're all going on holiday. <laughs> <laughs> Charlie, what's your big one for next year? Um, I think definitely for Q1's retention. You know, there's new audiences, you know, they've got that they've never experienced before and especially with Black Friday. The volume of like you know new visitors is you know how do you retain them how do you educate them how do you inject empathy awesome right thanks for joining us guys i think we'll leave it there um make sure everyone's following trend desk uh, where well, we're going to be publishing insights throughout the year uh, we'll a link i don't know where we are <laughs> cheers cheers thanks.